Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach and teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level, to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today's episode is nothing short of extraordinary, and the title is not a promotional magnet, but a serious fact. Humanity is facing an ET moment which begins a whole new era of human history. In fact, our history will have to be rewritten to a large extent, as we have crossed the point of no return. There is no going back. We are not in Kansas anymore. Some of you may be aware of the momentous event we'll be talking about, and to many, it may come as a shock. The disclosure has already happened, as far as I'm concerned. We are not alone. Extraterrestrial intelligent races and beings do exist. They have been visiting us for thousands of years and have been on planet Earth for some time, to this day, living amongst us. There has been contact and communication and even collaboration with other races. Our governments are in possession of retrieved alien spacecraft and alien bodies. And according to my guest, all this will be proven if it hasn't already with concrete evidence beyond doubt, beyond masquerade, and beyond cover-up. The implications of crossing this threshold for humanity are complex and huge. This event has the hallmarks of the Second Copernican Revolution, which was a complete shift in the field of astronomy from a geocentric understanding of the universe centered around Earth to heliocentric understanding centered around the Sun. The first paradigm shift of this magnitude triggered by the Polish astronomer Nicolaus Copernicus in the 16th century. We were effectively put in our place. <laughs> so now, five centuries later, we have stage two of this process of discovering our role and place in the universe as just one of the countless intelligent species out there. My biggest wish has always been to witness, in this lifetime, the moment of the formal acknowledgement that we are not alone, and also to meet and communicate personally with intelligent beings from other planets and planes of existence. It looks like my wish is coming true. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you my very special guest, Dr. Jim Garrison. Dr. Garrison is director of the Washington, D.C. office of the New Paradigm Institute, focused on the U.S. government's release to the public the information pertaining to unidentified anomalous phenomena. He also serves as convener of Humanity Raising Network, a daily broadcast on issues of global concern. Dr. Garrison is the author of several books and lectures on comparative philosophy and religion, world history and politics, and the implications of humanity's contact with extraterrestrial intelligent beings. You will find more information about Dr. Garrison and his work on the podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Dr. Garrison. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show, and thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you. As a starting point, setting the context for this conversation, could you please tell us about the recent U.S. government's official confirmation that we are not alone? Yes, thank you. Uh, good to be here. Uh, the recent legislation was a momentous milestone in human history. 
And uh, I was here in Washington uh, through all the vicissitudes of politicking and the reconciliation between the Senate and the House and scurrying around, uh, talking to various uh, parties involved in that. And uh, so it's a very interesting story. Last July 26th, uh, the House Government Operations National Security Subcommittee had a hearing during which David Grush, a very senior member of the U.S. intelligence community, stated categorically in open testimony under oath that, yes, the U.S. government does, in fact, have alien spacecraft. It does, in fact, have what he called biologics, extraterrestrial biological entities, and that there had been repression of this information uh, in Grush's view in an unconstitutional and illegal way. That was a major statement that reverberated around the world. A few weeks later, Senator Schumer uh, and Senator Rounds in a bipartisan effort uh, unanimously passed by the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, proposed the UAP Disclosure Act, the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena Disclosure Act, as an amendment to the 2024 National Defense Authorization Act, which is passed every December by the U.S. Congress to give the U.S. military the money and the support that it needs to do everything the U.S. military does around the world. So there are many amendments that go into this NDAA. And the Schumer Amendment was one of those amendments. Then around Thanksgiving, third week of November, the empire struck back. The defense corporations, the aerospace corporations uh, began to lobby. Mike Turner, uh, who is the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and Mike Rogers, who's the uh, chairman of the House uh, Armed Services Committee. Uh, Mike Turner comes from the uh, a district in Ohio where Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is, the largest Air Force Base in the world, uh, where all the ETs and the alien craft and the uh, ET bodies are all taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, among other places. But that's a central hub for all the research and reverse engineering. And every single major aerospace company has offices in his district. So he came out swinging, saying that they, we, we need to kill the bill. And then Mike Rogers, which is uh, uh, armed services, he came out. He's got a big Navy base down there and a lot of, a lot of Navy involvement in the uh, ET issue. So we almost lost the bill. They got Senate majority, uh, uh, Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell and the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, on their side. And we almost lost the bill. They wanted to eliminate it entirely. But at the last minute, you know, we were lobbying and <laughs> it was quite a scene. And Senator Schumer and Senator Rounds and Senator Rubio and Gillibrand, they fought back and we saved the bill. So what was passed by the Congress on uh, December 14th by the House and December 15th by the Senate, then signed into law by President Biden on the 22nd of De 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 December was the Unidentified Anomalous Records Collection Act. They changed the name. They had stripped all executive functions. Uh, the original bill had subpoena power and right of eminent domain, and they set up a special presidential council to oversee everything. All that was stripped away. But what they didn't strip, which was the only thing that really mattered, is that the U.S. government, as of December 22nd, 2023, is now on record stating that technologies of unknown origin, non-human technologies, and non-human intelligences exist, and that all government agencies, all contracting defense aerospace corporations that have had anything to do with UFOs, now called UAP, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, have to turn that information over to the National Archives, of the Library of Congress, of the U.S. government, starting in October 23 of this year. 
And even though there's no executive force and there will be all kinds of issues and fights and all of that, nevertheless, the U.S. government has now essentially said, we are not alone. Wow. That extraterrestrials exist, that there are alien craft that have been retrieved, there are alien bodies that have been retrieved, and that it's on record that all this information needs to go to the National Archive for a single purpose, and that is disclosure into the public domain. So we, as of January 1, 2024, when the law took effect, have begun humanity's ET moment. And that is uh, the one of the most important events in all of humanity. Absolutely. History. And I would say uh, it's not only the second uh, Copernican revolution, uh, but it is the second coming of fire. <laughs> yes. Which is even more momentous, because if you think about it, our ancestors discovered fire about a million years ago. So when Homo sapiens came along 250, 300,000 years ago, fire was one of the things we inherited by previous ancestral species. It was fire that allowed us to transform nature into technology, nature into culture. That's what fire does to food. You're turning nature into culture. Yes. That's what fire allows you to do with nature. You can get the iron ore and you can burn it down and melt it and make a plow or a gun or a spear, whatever it is that you want to do. So what we're now looking at is the second coming of fire because we're, we're being visited from the heavens with technologies that will as radically transform human consciousness and the human way of life and human technology as anything we invented through fire. So that's the moment that we're in. And we're just starting that moment. So it's an extremely exciting time to be alive. Wow, thank you for this summary. And as I said in my intro, I suspect that this information will come even as a shock to many listeners because it is still known to a relatively small number of people and it absolutely needs to be known and propagated everywhere. It is, I believe it is our right, every person's right on this planet to know that we are not alone. So let's now talk about the key implications of not just this event, but more broadly of the total paradigm shift for humanity, which, as I mentioned, I call the Second Copernican Revolution. So psychological, political, scientific, philosophical, cultural, perhaps starting with the psychological impact on the individual and collective levels. What does it mean to us? that we are not alone? Massive question. I think uh, in the first instance, I think the ET moment is going to cause us to reevaluate every aspect of human endeavor and even to reevaluate human identity. And so uh, the first imperative, I think, is for us to inform ourselves about what the truth is. I mean, we've had 80 years of secrecy, uh, classification, marginalization, and ridicule, so that even if you talked about UFOs, you were considered crazy. Now, all of a sudden, the U.S. government is admitting that they exist. And so the first thing we need to do is just educate ourselves. So that's the first thing I would say. And that's one thing that the New Paradigm Institute is doing in partnership with Ubiquity University. We've developed a training program, training program with two certificates, one by the New Paradigm Institute, 
uh, on the history, law, politics, and technologies of UAP. And then another one by Ubiquity University on extraterrestrial awareness and communication. Who are they? How do we communicate with them? So the first thing we all have to do is educate ourselves. I'm going to be taking other courses. And uh, so you can go to uh, newparadigminstitute.org or ubiquityuniversity.org, and you can uh, look for our extraterrestrial studies program. Uh, you can take the certificates on their own, or you can take both certificates together and then come into Ubiquity and write a graduate level dissertation for a master's or a PhD degree. So we need to, we need just simply to educate ourselves. Second thing we need to do is we need to make it a priority. So one of the things that the New Paradigm uh, Institute is, is doing is setting up uh, citizen action groups. Uh, we're calling them Citizens for Disclosure uh, all over the world. So whether you're in Australia or you're in Austria or you're in Kansas or you're in Brazil, local groups can come together to start educating themselves and start putting pressure on their governments to disclose what their governments know about this phenomenon. You know, it's not just the United States, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, the Argentines, the Chile. Almost every country in the world has had a, had a UFO experience. Many countries have uh, retrieved alien craft. Mexico, many countries. They've been keeping it secret. So wherever you are listening to this podcast, go to uh, New Paradigm Institute and form a Citizens for Disclosure group and start getting connected with other activist groups around the world. So that's that's one thing that 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 needs to be done. Thirdly, it's very important for uh, world religions to start taking in the implications of this metaphysically. You know, Every tradition has as at its origin a story that we were created by somebody else. You can call it God, you can, but it was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, yes. and, and all religious traditions have ET stories, right? So we need to start remembering those because the extraterrestrials are not a new phenomenon. They've been here for many, many eons of time. And we need to start to learn about them. That's part of our training. You know, what does Christianity mean uh, on Alpha Centauri? You know, and uh, what does the Buddha mean in uh, uh, the uh, uh, a parallel universe? So, I mean, there's all kinds of things. How does it affect governance? Um, how does it affect human relations? I mean, one of the things that the ETs have been telling us for some time Stop killing each other. Stop destroying the environment. Stop acting like a virus. We're here to help. So that's there are many, many areas. But the main thing is to educate and activate and prioritize the ET issue. Because we're the first generation of human beings in history to collectively, all at the same time, come into a realization that we're not alone. It's an extraordinary moment. It is. It absolutely is. I would like to now ask a, I guess, an obvious question that has been asked many times, and it feeds to the political and scientific implications, but obviously it goes beyond that. Why this has been kept as a secret? What are the main reasons for that? And why haven't it is simply landed on the White House loan? <laughs> well, those are two big questions. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer both of them. I think the reason why it has been kept so secret has a lot to do with the origin. And that goes back to the ending of World War II. The United States had just developed a nuclear bomb, which it had used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. World War II was a ferocious war, and the United States emerged victorious. And all of a sudden, it was observing technologies of unknown origin over its airspace. 
that it had no idea about. And that technology could do anything it wanted. Was it Russian? Was it German? Was it Japanese? What was going on? If you read the early correspondence in the military, they, they were astonished that the U.S. military had no control over its own airspace. And they certainly didn't want the Russians to know that. So when Roswell happened in 1947, in July of 1947, in a crash landing, they wanted to know how these beings did this. But it was interpreted in a highly militarized way because we had just finished a major war and we were now being confronted by another potential enemy that we had no control over. So what President Truman did is three things that have shaped the human future. Number one, they created a classification for this that was even more secret than nuclear weapons technology. Number two, they created what they initially called the Majestic 12. This was so sensitive and so potentially significant that the government couldn't even really handle it. The Congress couldn't really even handle it. So they created a small cabal of men from, you know, the Pentagon and the intelligence community and the Harvard, MIT engineering departments. And these created what became the deep state, that the information was considered so sensitive, like the Manhattan Project. When, you know, President Roosevelt did the Manhattan Project to produce the bomb, nobody in Congress was even informed. They kept it completely secret. So that secrecy came into the UFO in spades, on steroids. And they said, like nuclear, nuclear physics exists at every university and nuclear weapons is kept secret. But the UFOs were so sensitive that they said, we're not even going to admit that anything exists, right? And then the third thing they did was start through the CIA in the late 1940s, a systematic campaign in the media, in academia, on TV, to say, not only does this not exist, if you believe it, if you even talk about it, you're crazy, right? So underneath that, what were they doing? They were trying to reverse engineer the ET technology to build a UFO weapon that would really get the Russians, really get the Chinese and ensure U.S. global supremacy. So you put all those things together and you've got the, all the ingredients for what's happened. And that is why the UFO phenomenon until just recently has been completely off the public radar. The problem was that so many people were seeing them at such different levels of government that finally the cat just burst out of the, the bag, as it were. Um, but the, the origin, and, the, and, and then uh, this was complicated and further metastasized with the fossil fuel industry. They didn't want anybody to know about ET technologies that could solve all of our global energy problems and solve climate change. They wanted to keep selling fossil fuels. So the fossil fuel military industrial complex has conspired to keep this not only secret, but all the technologies repressed because they want to sell oil, even if it means destroying the world. That's how disconnected these guys are. So uh, that's, that's, I, I, that's in a very simple terms what has basically governed uh, the UFO phenomenon uh, to ensure that the U.S. government and the Russian governments and the Chinese governments have been doing the same thing. 
How do they reverse engineer these technologies so that they can develop a weapon that will really destroy the world? It's, it's insane, but they're all in on it. And of course, the U.S. preponderantly, uh, but uh, it's a really a sad commentary. There's a documentary that's been made by Stephen Greer called The Lost Century. And it's basically how the human race lost 100 years because of the military industrial fossil fuel complex, not allowing UFO technology to be brought out into public domain, which leads to your second question. Why aren't these guys landing on the White House lawn, man, and coming out and saying, come on, you guys, the gig is up. Well, that's a question nobody can answer. But what we do seem to know is that we're being observed. Remember, if you're a million years more advanced than we humans, you're looking at humans much like we, a scientist, a human scientist goes into the jungle and he sees a bug. And he's looking at the bug, you know, and it probably doesn't occur to them to kind of announce himself to the bug. Uh, he wants to observe this bug and uh, find out how does it work? And, uh, and he, you know, there's abduction experiences where they've taken humans up and they poke them and they, uh, they uh, take blood samples and they do all the things to humans that we do to bugs, that we do the other species, right? And so what we do know is that extraterrestrials, the people who've reported that they've had ET experiences, most of them are said, have been told by the ET, stop killing each other. Stop destroying the implant. You become a virus to the to, to, to the earth. So we we the what the evidence seems to indicate that we're being observed by multiple species of extraterrestrials. Most of which are benign, some may be malevolent. Uh, but the basic communication is you're acting in very destructive ways, particularly with nuclear weapons. And you need to stop. You need to get it together. You need to be worthy of your ET experience. <laughs> you need to be worthy of your <laughs> ET moment because we're serious players. We've been around for millions of years. You know, bug. <laughs> 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 okay, yes, the very good point. Now, what is your view in this context? What is your view on many claims? often quite detailed, made by a number of people, uh, claims of direct knowledge and even involvement and contact with ETs in various government exchange programs. So in other words, claims about an ongoing collaboration. So we're now going, so this is going above being observed as a bug, as you said, but it's more about actual collaboration, exchange programs, most of my listeners are familiar with Gaia program, and there are few series that have guests openly speaking about it. So what is your view? Is it potentially true? Um, is it true, actually true, or is it just uh, for um, entertainment? If I was president, that's exactly what I'd do. Try to establish contact with these beings and find out how can we develop some kind of partnership? From our point of view, we want their technology. We're the dominant country on the planet. If they're going to ally with any government, it's going to be with the United States. But because we are keeping this completely secret, <laughs> even from the Congress, even from most of the government, even from the president, 
it becomes difficult to put this in the public domain. So I believe myself, based on what I know, and who, you know, who knows? Everything is in the spirit of truth pursued, not truth possessed. I think it's perfectly reasonable to think that the U.S. government and the Russian government and the Chinese government uh, uh, have, have established contact. There may be collaboration going on. Uh, who knows? I don't know. Probably not more of it than a handful of people on the planet know. But it's, but it's important that, um, that we take it seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. As a possibility. Uh, I'm a good friend of uh, uh, Richard Dolan. He's the great historian. You know, his UFOs in the national security state, the two volume history is stupendous. Everybody should read Richard Dolan's UFO in the national security state, volume one and volume two. He's now in the process of publishing another two volumes on USOs unidentified submerged objects, the UFOs or UAP that are under the sea. And there's a lot of evidence that the, the ETs have bases inside mountains under the sea. I mean, it's extraordinary. If these beings are who they are and they're millions of years in advance, they can do virtually anything. And if they're coming in from a parallel universe, man, game over. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's part of what's the beautiful beauty of this moment, Anna, is everything is now possible. Humanity doesn't have to live anymore in the limitations of the world is flat or we're the center. We're part of a massive matrix of living possibility. Yeah. And, and it's so liberating. Totally. It's a completely liberating moment for humanity. We don't need to be killing each other. The Israel, look at what's happening in Israel. They're committing genocide against defenseless Palestinians. They're committing the crime of crimes. What, what, they should be in a single state with the Palestinians working hand in hand, arm in arm. They're both Semites. So it's not only genocide, it's fratricide that Israel's committing in, in Gaza. That's insane. They should be talking to the ETs. I mean, that's what the possibilities are for humanity. And that's why in the training program, we want to train people to communicate with extraterrestrials, which you can do through remote, remote viewing, mental telepathy. It's, it's all possible. This is what humans should be doing. We should be engaging in interspecies communication, talking to this olive tree behind me. Talking to the orchid behind me, because they they say if you can if you can speak to other sentient beings, you can communicate with the ETs. Yes. The problem is we're so dependent on our cell phones. Yes. We let our technology. Yes. Do it. It's time we stop. We need to put the technology away for a while, and just learn how to be mindful, learn how to communicate with the other species and begin to lighten up a bit. We do not need to be in war. We do not need to be committing genocide at this moment in human history. It's insane. Yes, I completely agree with you. Thank you. You mentioned communication and telepathy, and uh, that was in fact my next question, <laughs> because when people hear and talk about ET contact, The first question they ask is, how can we communicate with them? Do they speak English <laughs> or whatever language the person, the person speaks? But of course, ETs use the universal language of telepathy. So the next step, linking back to your earlier comments, is to learn telepathic communication, which is not that difficult. And we all have the capacity to learn, starting from meditation mindfulness, sure. remote viewing, of course. developing our sixth sense, because it is, it is ridiculous to think that ETs will know every language on the planet, on our planet. See, now, now we need to be more specific on our, in our language, <laughs> on our planet, 
or that they will carry some sort of translator devices. It's all communication by telepathy. And I understand that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that one of your uh, training programs includes uh, this sort of yes. training? Yes. It does. Yeah. Um, uh, that's the training program through Ubiquity University. Uh, and uh, uh, But you're absolutely right. Everybody should be prioritizing ET awareness and communication. We need to know what the facts are. We need to know how to communicate with them because they are the human future. And we cannot, with something this important, let our governments be the only ones talking to the ETs. I'm telling you, as an American, you do not want the U.S. government being the one talking to the ETs. All they want is to build weapons. I want to get to know the ETs. Who are they? What's their history? What do they believe about the universe? Uh, how can we learn from them? How can we trade with them? How can we exchange cultural um, uh, awareness? Uh, this is a very exciting moment. And all you need to do, and, and you're right, they speak all languages because they engage in mental telepathy. So if you're Chinese or you're Greek or you're Bolivian or whatever, you just engage in mental telepathy and you'll experience it in your language. That's what mental telepathy is. <laughs> and remote viewing as well. If you can remote view, you can communicate with the ETs. It's a side effect. It's a byproduct. Yes. And for people who might ask, well, so how, how does this mental telepathy work, what I could say is that this is like your insights. When you are getting intuitive insights from your spiritual guidance, you are getting either a, an, an image or, or you hear words or you get some just a sense of knowing. And this is all in your language. Now, does the spirit speak all the languages? Well, yes and no. All languages come in as one in mental telepathy or mental communication. It's basically energy transfer or energy communication, which contains all languages, probably in the universe, <laughs> but it is really mental telepathy. And it's not that difficult to learn, is it? All you have to do is learn how to become mindful. Follow your breath, focus. And after a while, you know, there's training programs. There's lots of training programs that you can engage in, in, in terms of mental telepathy training, remote viewing training. Uh, Ubiquity University and the New Paradigm Institute will be jointly offering courses in remote viewing, uh, meditative practices uh, that will enable you to communicate uh, with extraterrestrials. All that are, are in the certificate programs that we're, we're offering. Uh, it's it's an essential part. You know, we need to learn the mother tongue. In school, we learned how to gr speak Greek and Hebrew and French and German. We, we have to stop learning other human languages and start learning how to, in, to talk with the trees, to talk with the dolphins, to talk with our cats and dogs, uh, to talk with uh, the flowers. All, they're all sentient beings, and we can communicate with them. We just have to let our cell phones yeah. go, go into ourselves. And then that's when ET, ET speak will become real. Let's now address briefly the main fear people have about contact with other species in the universe. And it comes down to the question, do they all have the same agenda? or do they have different agendas? In other words, are they all good guys or are there bad guys who don't necessarily have our best interest at heart? I think that's an open question. I think most of people's experiences have been very benign. Uh, the communications about stop killing each other are done in a helpful spirit. There's almost no examples anywhere in the world of alien craft coming in and shooting people and killing people. Uh, there, there's one or two, apparently, uh, where human 
fighter air force started to shoot at them. But most of the time when they started even to think about shooting the UFOs, the whole system goes down. So there's no evidence of malevolent intent uh, by and large. There's, there's stories of abductions where people have been terrified, but heck, don't you think that the, all the animals that the human beings, scientists have poked and tested are terrified like we are when the ETs do it to us? You know, they're, they're, they're probing us as scientists. Um, and there's also discussions around, you know, there's cattle mutilations, you know, examples in the United States and other countries where apparently they come in and, and dissect cattle and do various things to cows and other animals. Uh, is that malevolent or is that just scientific? Just who are these beings? You know, it's like, remember, I guess, looking at the bugs, you know, uh, what, what, uh, what, what are these comprised of? But I would say generally, whatever they are, and they'll probably be as mixed as we are, because the light and shadow dimensions are cosmic principles, not just terrestrial principles. Our job, Anna, is to approach our ET moment with an open heart. If I meet you as a stranger, I want to be open to you. I want to be curious about you. I want to be friendly with you. I want to invite you to my house for dinner. I want to learn your language. If we do that with the ETs, I think they're going to generally respond in kind. If I approach you with a gun in fear, thinking that I've got to dominate you and tie you up and put you in a cage to make sure that you're never going to hurt me. I'm going to elicit another kind of response from you. So when you meet a stranger, my view, you say, hello, how are you? What's your story? This is my story. Let's go have lunch. And I, so I think what we at the New Paradigm Institute and Ubiquity University are trying to say with our training program and our Citizen for, Di for Disclosure uh, program is we first need to understand what we're dealing with. Just let's inform ourselves and let's uh, communicate with them in an open way. Yeah. Then let's gather data. You know, if they end up to be negative, you, cl you close out the communication. If they end up being really cool, you keep going. So that's that's our basic orientation. Yes, yes, and a very good one. So in other words, we don't need to fear an invasion as some some people propose, you know, scaremongering. Yes, thank you. Well, Jim, what are your final thoughts? Is there anything else that you would like to add to this amazing conversation? And we need to wrap it up only because of the time pressures. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. we would be talking about it for half a day, if not the full day. So I would just add one note. Uh, as I've been getting into it, I'm realizing that I'm finally understanding why human beings were created by Mother Earth. I always wondered, why were we created? We're so different from everybody else. Why are we here? And I think one of the reasons why we're so destructive with each other and with the planet, we have no idea why we're here. Well, I think the reason why we're here is now becoming apparent. Earth created the human species as an ambassador for Earth with the cosmic federations and civilizations we're now going to interact with. The elephants couldn't do it. The dolphins can't do it. We're the only species that's dexterous enough to leave the planet, to travel to Alpha Centauri, to travel to Orion or Sirius, where apparently a lot of these ETs come from. It was our generation, the generation where we had our ET moment that we went to the moon. We discovered LSD. So we're opening the doors of perception. We're able to leave the planet. That's why we're here, folks. As ambassadors, our role is to be ambassadors of the planet. 
to the larger cosmic ecosystem of life. And that fills me with great excitement and deep gratitude to be alive at this time. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful thought, Jim. And throughout this conversation, you have made so many really important points. And I'm sure that some of those will be very new to many of my listeners. So I really appreciate your time and this conversation. I will obviously include all the links and your bio and all the links or information about your programs in the show notes so people can contact you and, well, continue this exploration. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.